Well, I believe that being easy to understand should be the gold standard for good and for maintainable software. And let me ask you a question. How often do your business users surprise you with new requirements? Boom, there it goes. Eh? Are we familiar with this situation? Right, okay. We all know that when new requirements come as a surprise, it means that we didn't understand the business in the first place. I mean we in a broad sense of the word. But surprising requirements makes software harder and harder to maintain and to evolve. And there is a great power creating software. I mean, uh, when we implement the needs of our users and organizations into functional software, we are materializing ideas out of thin air and creating and having a real impact in the world. And that is, is very close to magic. Yet, very often, we lose sight of the business requirements and we focus instead in technology, in a new shiny architectural pattern or a new framework. And, but when we lose sight of the business requirements, uh, there is no amount of clean code, clean architecture, solid principles, hexagonal, event-driven, whatever. That is going to help your code to be easy to understand, easy to maintain, and easy to evolve. So if we want to create value, for our businesses and for our users. Uh, we need to find a way to, to communicate with business experts in their own language. Uh, and domain-driven design, which is already 20 years old and is still more relevant than ever, already proposes to use a common language, an ubiquitous language to, to communicate as the key tool for communication between business experts and technical experts. But in practice, at least in my experience, it's very rare to see a ubiquitous language being used, I mean, across the development process. I mean, even if we take the effort in creating a common language, there are many translation points to propagate that language through code, through documentation, through text. So it requires a, a lot of work, a lot of manual work. So if we want to use a ubiquitous language effectively, we need something or some way to propagate it automatically, not manually, to propagate that language that we build with the help of business experts to code, to documentation, and, and to tests. Um, and if a ubiquitous language is rare, Hold on, because even rare is to find business experts available during the software development process. I mean, how often do you find business experts available to you? I mean, any lucky one? Say hello? Okay, if when business experts are not available, if we want to create software of value, we are in trouble. So we need to find a way to communicate with business experts. And obviously, they are not available because they are busy, but I believe that they are also hesitant to speak with technical people, that we speak in a foreign language to them. They speak the language of the business processes, and we insist in speaking about APIs, gateways, pipelines, Kubernetes. So they are hesitant to speak with us. And so we want to create value for a company, for an organization, or for our users. We need to find a way to communicate with business experts in their own language. So, okay, event storming, which is a shop a, for sharing knowledge between domain experts and, and technical experts, um, is, is, is very convenient in this aspect because it focuses on the language of the business. It, it leaves technical discussions uh, for later, but at the same time, it uh, is um, it's very well sweet for event-driven architecture, for describe event-driven architectures. But, so we can, this is a very low barrier entrance for business people to participate. We can run, if we run one of these workshops successfully, uh, we can get a lot of understanding. There are many, many shapes and sizes for event storming workshops. There are big picture event storming workshops for understanding a, 
a whole company or one big domain. There are also a small picture workshops for designing a one bounded context or one service. And if we run successfully one of these, uh, these workshops, we still need to translate this into a technical design. And a Sync API, which is the de facto, de facto standard for event-driven architectures, can cover a big portion of these discoveries. And with the, with the new version, with version three, that is also helps uh, document how different applications connect together, we can even cover a bigger portion of, the, of an event storming session. But I believe it's too technical to be an ubiquitous language. It's, very, it's a very nice specification for describing the event-driven architecture that we discovered here. But I think once we dive into API design, we lose the ability to request feedback for, from business experts. So in this session, we are going to present you a, a, a domain-specific language, the ThemeWave uh, Wave modeling language, uh, which, ca which can, can map all the discoveries of an event storming session and is designed to be developer friendly because it's very compact and very concise format. Uh, but at the same time, it still retains the language of the business that we discovered during the event storming session. So if we do it right, uh, we can retain that language of the business and because it's machine friendly, we can convert it into multiple software artifacts including API definitions like OpenAPI, like a Sync API version two and version three, documentation, drawings, and multiple backend implementations for MongoDB, um, for JPA, an API test. There are a lot of, there are a never growing set of plugins because it's plugin based. So now we are going to give you a quick uh, overview of what an event storming session looks like and then we are going to show you how we can uh, compress the feedback loop between expert knowledge and a conceptual model and working software uh, with tests. So now with the help of my friend, Ivan Del Viejo Garcia, which is business analyst, we work together on a daily basis here at Thank Singular. He's going to explain what an event storming session looks like. Yes, well, I will try to do and I will try to be fast, okay? Um, first of all, um, this guy here uh, looks like me, but he's not me. This is uh, Alberto Brandolini. He is the creator of the, the event storming. Um, well, as, as Ivan has explained before, uh, event storming is a flexible workshop format for explanation of, of business domain, okay? Uh, involves people from, from business, business experts, and also technical, technical experts. Um, we can apply event storming for the, the, the whole uh, business domain, just um, taking like a big picture of the, the full domain, or also with a small processes in a, in a small picture, okay? So I'm going to present you a, a very quick uh, example, is a parking lot. Um, this parking lot has three simple systems. It's just a reservation system, has also a entrance control and finally a, a payment um, gateway, okay? So, first of all, uh, I would like to show you this cheat sheet because for me it's very, very useful. I, I always have in, in mind when I was working in that. And it has all the elements that we are, we use in, in even storming. We have uh, events, we have commands, we have uh, external system, aggregate, data model, uh, business rules or, or policies. Um, also, here represent the way that all these elements interact between each other. Um, the first element I, I would like to, to send you, okay, um, is events. Um, events into a domain is something that happens, something relevant for the domain and we use a uh, orange sticky note. Um, we are going to try to identify all the events in, the, in our example. We have, uh, well, we have 
um, uh, spot reservation, we have the car entrance of any car, we have a control when, when the parking loss is, is complete, and also we have events for, for payment, and also when a car goes out. Um, we continue with the next element of event storming. We have commands. Command is a request for, for starting, for starting uh, events, okay? Um, command is, um, sorry, uh, commands are requests, okay? It's not a start anything, but we are going to show the next elements. And for example, let's identify the commands. For our example, we have a, a spot reservation, we have a car entrance request, we have a port spot count, uh, a car parking, a payment, and also when a car go out, okay? We have here another sticky note, different from the blue one that I have explained, are the actors. Um, actors in the real world invoke commands. Um, there are other ones, another command that has not actors, I'm going to explain in a, in a pair of spreads, okay? So, next elements. Uh, we have systems, okay? Um, commands uh, don't invoke um, by itself, okay? Commands are invoked on system, and events are produced by system. So we need this element to, to fill the gap between commands and events. Um, I'm going to show you system, no matter is external, system or internal. I will explain this later. So in our example, we have a system, a spot control system. Um, I'm going, it's going to be common for most of the, the command that we have. Uh, we have another one for a payment, okay? When a car, when a car has to pay for, for his place, then have a payment gateway. So um, we continue. Uh, so the next element here is the, the data model. In this moment, uh, when we talk about data model, probably developers start to think in database. So, but we need data model because um, for making any decision, we need data. Um, that's the reason for the data model. We identify several data models. We have, for example, a booking ID, is an identification, probably has more data, like space, time, whatever, but it's, it's a data model, okay? License plate for cars, we have also a spot ID for the car places into the parking lot. Um, with them we can play with the database, with the data model. Next element, um, we have policies or business rules, okay? Uh, a policy behind a, into a business domain is something that is automated or just something we have to remember. It's, it's very useful, for example, in the next example, when a reservation is done or a car gets into our parking lot, then automatically we launch uh, another command, okay, with our business rule. Um, Commands can be thrown by uh, actors and also by business rules, by policies, okay? When a car or reservation is done, we need to make account of places available. And another one is um, when a car spot is paid with our payment gateway, then we can liberate the car to go out, the parking lot. Um, I continue with the, the last element, probably the key element here, because aggregate is one of the fundamental patterns of, of the mind driven design. Now with this element, we are linking, we are linking the business uh, knowledge with the development uh, in, a, in our daily job, okay? In our example, we are modifying, uh, we have changed system here, now we are going to use internal system, we are going to modify with uh, aggregate, the spot control, 
And for the payment gateway, we are going to keep like a external event. A external event, a payment gateway that we use, we contract it, and, and we integrate. We don't implement, we integrate only. But the, um, the aggregate is something that we are going to implement. Um, finally, well, there are more sticky notes for event storming. We are not going to explain now. There are hotspot, sticky values that are very useful for business. But um, now I'm going to let Ivan to make his magic and explain how we are going to, modif to, to modify this in a software development. So, Ivan, okay. it's your turn. Okay, thank you, Ivan. Thank you. Okay. So now we have a thank you for this overview, Ivan. So now that we had a quick overview of what an event storming session looks like, I will try to explain how we can uh, shorten the feedback loop, loop between expert knowledge, a conceptual model, and the working software and its tests. So we are going to, to design a small service, a bounded context. We are going to use the ZDL domain language for describing the inside of the service. And we are going to use very well-known APIs like OpenAPI and Async API for external communication, inter-process communication. But there are connections between them. We are going to see. And this is how we can map all the elements of, a, of an event storming session. Uh, I borrowed the syntax for J Hipster, from J Hipster project, which is a very nice um, open source project for generating full stack uh, applications for REST applications, and uh, it's a um, battle-tested uh, format. So for aggregates, we have entities with their relationships, and for commands, this is, well, this is an extension. We borrowed the syntax, but it's an extension. No? For commands, we got services and inputs, and for domain events, we got events. And if we go inside, for for aggregates, we got entities with fields, the field type, some validations. We got the relationships, we got enums, and we map the root of our aggregates with this uh, annotation, with this little annotation. We can have one or many aggregates in our system. And if, we are use, if you are using a documental database, we don't need relationships. It's much easier. We can have direct reference between between entities, and we can even nest entities one inside each other, so it's much easier to read and to understand the, the documental model. And for events, it's exactly the same syntax. Uh, we have fields, we have reference, and we have nested objects. And we have this little annotation copy, where we can copy all the fields for a given entity that we already described somewhere else. And because these events are produced inside the system, but they are going to be sent outside the system through an API. We have some annotation, which is the async API annotation, which serves two purposes. One purpose is to document how it connects this event inside your system that you are going to produce with the external async API, which is the source of truth for your communication. And the second purpose is that uh, we can generate the, a draft version of your async API from these annotations. And because this format is very compact and concise, we can generate for you a version 2 or version 3 of the async API specification. Actually, we have some small glitches that I learned today in the version 3 generator, but we are going to cover that uh, as, soon as, as soon as we can. Um, Okay, for commands, uh, we got services. Services for aggregates, uh, the command name, the command payload, which is an input with events. And we can have a list of events or we can have uh, choose one or the other. And there is a special marker, which is the ID, which means that this command is to be executed on a given instance of an aggregate. This is not a, this is not a method interface. This, the only special market that we can have, and this is it. With this, we can map uh, how our, what the commands are, are we accepting. And because commands are also connected to the external world, 
we have the async API annotation, two purposes. Documenting how it connects to the external world, to the async API, which is the source of truth, and code generation. We can generate uh, an async API version two and version three, and we also have REST annotations, again, two purposes. Documenting how it connects to the external world and code generation. We can generate a draft version of your open API. So, uh, because we are referencing a lot of APIs, at the top of the file we can describe, define which APIs we are using, if we are a provider or if we are a client. And the, UR, the URI can be inside your project or can be in a developer portal, whatever. And, and last, there is a configuration section where we can define some plugins and inside IntelliJ, we can run these plugins to generate code. And because ThinkWave is plugin based, each of these plugins is just a jar, so you can create your own, you can fork existing uh, plugins to suit your needs, you can publish it to uh, Maven Central, you can publish it to your own uh, artifactory, you can contribute it, whatever you like. This will be, I expect this to be a bazaar for pe from people creating plugins. So now a practical example. Uh, we are going to, to create, um, to implement a service, a small service, a small bonded context for a customer which has a list of addresses. And these are the commands that we are going to expose through a REST API, they are CRUD commands. CRUD commands are specials because the, the generator can understand what the implementation is. If they were not crude commands, it will leave a small placeholder for you to fill, the, to fill the details, but these are crude commands. And we are going to publish some events as part of these commands for creation, deletion, update. Um, so let's go. Okay, so inside IntelliJ with the autocomplete, we add the plugins to the config section and we fill some data. And we are going to generate an open API draft version with the annotations that I showed you before. We are going to generate an async API draft version. So here they are, open API. Well, these are draft versions for you to customize, ideally in collaboration with your consumers. And when you are ready, in the POM, we configure two plugins, the Open API generator that we all know about uh, for Open API, and the same way Maven plugin for a Sync API that can generate code for Open API, for a Sync API version two and version three. So as part of your, of your build, I'm doing test compile to generate the sources. It's going to generate in the target folder some code for you. The open API uh, generator is going to generate some interfaces and DTOs for you to implement the service. This is the interface for Spring MVC. And for a sync API, it generates the DTOs for the events and one interface with the names of your domain and one implementation that uses a Spring Cloud Streams. And now we generate a backend. We are going to generate the inside of the backend. So here we have domain entities annotated for MongoDB. We got one service interface for inbound communication with some DTOs. We got uh, Spring Data Mongo repositories for talking to the data store. We got some tests, uh, unit tests, and integration tests for you to fill the details. I mean, this is not complete. It's for you to, to jump start. And now we need to connect the inside with the outside. So we generate some open API controllers for Spring MVC, some mappers, and one skeleton of a Spring MVC controller implementing the API. And there are some to-do tasks for you because we need to connect the outside API with the inside of your, of your implementation. So this video was recorded live. There are no cuts, I mean, it, so here I'm editing these to-do tags, and when I'm done, 
I connected the outside API with the inside implementation. So now I will rest I start the application. We have some containers, Kafka, MongoDB, and I start the application. And we are going to send some tests. We are going to send a post to create a new customer. So here is the post. When the application starts, I send the post. And here it is 201 status code and the MongoDB ID for the customer. And what about publishing events? Well, we already have the code generated for us before, so only, we only need to auto wire the customer events producer and as part of the create customer command, for instance, we just need to instantiate the event DTO, new customer created. We fill some data with customer ID and with customer details. I'm not going to fill all the data here, but we get the, the idea. And now we can just use the events producer that we already have generated by Maven plugin. So now we are going to restart the application. We place a breakpoint here so we can see that after a customer is created, the event is sent to Kafka. So here is restarting. I send the post, the breakpoint, so the console, and when I release the breakpoint, here it is. The message went into Kafka. And this video was recorded in one shot. It has a small acceleration, but this is how quickly uh, you can move from a conceptual model, from, no, from business as knowledge to a conceptual model, uh, to work in software and its tests. And if you do it right, it will retain the language of, those, of your business experts and it will propagate automatically through your code, through your tests, and through your documentation, and through your API. So next steps for you, well, read about event storming. You can read the book of uh, Alberto Brandolini. There are other sources, Alberto Brandolini, which is here he, with me helping. <laughs> You can read also about the, the CTL domain language, which is very compact. I borrow the syntax for, from Jay Hipster, which I love, Jay Hipster, I have to say. And install the same way domain model editor for IntelliJ. And we will continue improving the developer experience, helping you create software easy to understand. And now if you have some, you have some questions, we will be happy to, to take it. I'm not sure if I, ah, um, it, we are always looking for talent in singular. We have to say this, right? Yeah. Do you already have some customers using uh, this kind of uh, development approach? Can yeah. you share also some insights? Uh, we use it internally in our projects to speed up, uh, but the release of this software is, uh, I mean, we, we could manage to get to this conference almost on time. <laughs> but because, yes, we got the compromise to do this talk even before we, it was finished, but we use it. We use it in a daily basis for small projects yet. Thank you. But, but we expect people to start using it soon. OK. Um, before I ask the question, some context. From what I've observed from the uh, event storming, yeah. we are combining REST and event-driven uh, APIs. Yeah. And the REST API is usually between the user who triggers, I think you called it the actors, who triggers, who makes a request, and then the back end uh, receives that request and triggers events to other services, if I understood yeah. that correctly. So usually there's a REST API between the user and the back end, yeah. and then it, the back end dispatches events to other systems. Yeah. Um, yeah. My question then is, uh, and this was also the same theme from, I think, Benjamin's talk. 
And my question now is, why isn't, it, why isn't there a world where the user's action is considered an event that is triggered and treated as such? You know, where uh, placing an order is considered an event that different systems can potentially respond to. Um, is this something that is possible? I don't know if this is a question that I should be asking to you directly, no, but this is just a thought. It's okay. I maybe I think I understand your question. When you are the, once you are doing the, the event storming workshop, uh, you are trying to uncover how your business works. So you leave aside, in that moment, you leave aside um, technical aspects on technical discussions. But because you are already an engineer, you're already thinking about this will be a, a REST API, this will be an event, this will be, but in, while, during that moment, you leave it aside. And uh, practically, when you see that an action is started by a user, uh, more often than not, it's a, it's a REST API, because, a synchronous API because the user needs to communicate with something that is going to take that, that request. So, and there are also other actions that can be started by external systems or policies, which uh, they used to be, they tend to be um, asynchronous. But in the, in the moment of the, the event storming, you don't decide that. I mean, you're already thinking about that, but as a rule, a small rule, if an actor is starting the action, will be a REST API. And if, a, if it's a system or a, or a policy, it could be a, a REST API or it could be an event-driven API. And my question is, why can't the... Okay, so when you are a user, a real user, and you have to, you need a data, normally uh, you use a front end and probably you need right now when you request the data you need right now normally this is uh, something for for rest api um, no. in a system that probably need to to gather all the information to to collect the information and make processes and about this information to present to users then the proper uh, the proper element to use is uh, a sync a sync api so for me the rule is probably front end uh, is going to need um, a REST API. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I think that answers my question then. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Hi, great talk. Um, I would just like to add one thing. Um, <clears throat> we have also a lot of, uh, we see a lot of implementations where front ends directly consume an asynchronous API. So, the fact I was talking about that synchronous and asynchronous APIs should be combined was that there's still a lot of demands for REST APIs, but, and this is the big one, uh, modern interfaces, modern user interfaces might integrate directly with an asynchronous API without the REST API, for example, by using WebSockets. So that's what we also see a lot. So just to clarify this, not that the message from earlier was like, you have to use REST APIs for user interfaces. That's not a fact, so, but you still have it a lot. That's, that's the message, yeah. Sorry, hope that was okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for, for your help. Okay, we will be around. We are going to have lunch together now, so we can talk about this, about that, and about everything, so. Thank you for uh, for this morning sessions and this work. Yeah. Okay. Well done, okay.